So in the last video, we looked at the sum of weighted execution times as being a pretty good measure, except that it required a reference machine. So instead, let's look at you know, whether, the, whether the geometric mean can be an appropriate measure. For those of you that have forgotten, the geometric mean of n numbers of n numbers is the nth root of the product of those n numbers. Okay, so the GM in this case for system A would be the cube root of you know 10 times 8 times 25. Okay, so in this case again, if, if a program has a rather large execution time, it does play a pretty big role in determining the GM. The key difference over here is that if I try to introduce an optimization that improves one of the three programs, it really doesn't matter which of the three programs that optimization applies to. Okay, so for example, you know, let's say that I introduce something that worsens execution time by a factor of 1.2. If that happens over here, the new GM would be you know, cube root of you know, 10 times 1.2 times 8 times 25. If I instead uh, worsen the execution time of program P3, in that case, the new GM would be you know, 10 times 8 times 25 times 1.2, right? So, uh, you know, hurting the execution of programs by a factor of 1.2 impacts GM in exactly the same way, regardless of which program that, uh, that de-optimization was being applied to, okay? So GM has that nice property that it does give each program equal importance, even, you know, and, and by multiplying these numbers, you are, uh, you're able to eliminate the need for a reference machine. You don't have to normalize these numbers and you can compare the behavior of any two programs without requiring this reference machine. Okay, and because of this practical advantage, you know, this is the measure that is actually being used for something like the spec rating. Okay, the disadvantage of using geometric means is you're multiplying execution times. And that does not correspond to any real or natural process, right? Normally, when you when you run and measure a workload, you are running programs sequentially. You're you're adding up your execution times. So taking the product of execution times does not seem like a natural process, and that leads to inconsistencies in certain cases. And I'll show you that with an example on this next slide. Okay, so I have two programs, P1 and P2. They're executing on three machines, A, B, and C. Okay, so the geometric means. Of this of this workload on each of the machines is uh, root of thousand, root of thousand, and root of four hundred. So based on these geometric means, I'm concluding that you know A and B have the same performance, and C is about 1.6 times faster. Okay, so let's try to construct a workload with P1 and P2, which matches these conclusions. Okay, let's see if let's see if I can do that. All right, and the only way to do that is to construct a workload where you know P1 occurs hundred times for every occurrence of P2. Okay, so for this particular workload, let's see what the execution times are gonna be. On system A, that execution time will be 1100 seconds. On system B, it'll also be 1100 seconds because I've carefully chosen the ratio of P1 and P2. But on system C, that total execution time is much higher, which is opposite of what I had concluded based on the GMs. And that is the disadvantage of using geometric means, right? It, it's, it may sometimes be impossible to construct a workload which matches the conclusions that uh, your geometric means gave you. Okay, so in spite of this, you know, that the, uh, the fact that you don't need a reference machine is what makes it a compelling metric. Arithmetic mean, on the other hand, is, is technically a superior metric, but it has this, this, uh, this disadvantage that every year or so you need to you know, recompute what your reference machine is going to be. Okay, so you know now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'll talk briefly about the CPU performance equation, and then that'll give us the tools to talk about a few other metrics as well. Okay, so firstly, let me just introduce this notion of a clock, uh, you know, which I'm sure many people already are aware of, but essentially the clock is this voltage pulse that is applied to your system, right? And on every rising clock edge, you know, that's the signal for most circuits to start doing their work. And before the next rising clock edge is applied, you know, all of the circuits need to finish their work because the next rising clock edge signals the start of you know, yet new work. Okay, so every cycle, you know, all of your circuits will try to finish their task and move on to a new task in the next cycle. Okay, and the gap between these two consecutive rising clock edges 
you know, let's say it's one nanosecond, that is referred to as the clock cycle time. Okay, and your clock speed is nothing but the inverse of your cycle time, which in this case would be one gigahertz. That is, a billion clock cycles are being applied every single second. Okay, so now I'm going to use this breakdown in characterizing my total execution time for a program. Okay, so the total time taken by a program to finish, which I'm calling here as CPU time, is a function of the number of instructions I had to execute. So let's say that the, the, uh, let's say that the program is made up of you know one billion instructions. Okay, now I have to figure out you know exactly how many cycles does it take me to finish all of these instructions. Okay, so let's just look at a timeline, an example timeline, and I'm showing all the cycles over here with these dots. Okay, so let's say that an instruction finished in the very first cycle. In the very very next cycle, I was able to finish a second instruction. Okay, and then maybe I went you know four cycles without finishing an instruction, because let's say that the third instruction had to do a lot of work. Okay, so it took four cycles for me to finish that instruction. Okay, then next cycle I was able to finish one more instruction. Then finishing the next instruction took me say three cycles, maybe because I had to get data from somewhere and that took a long time. Okay, so every instruction has uh, ha has a different con completion time, you know, based on what happens inside your mi microprocessor. Okay, and so based on this example, I'm concluding that on average, it takes about, you know, 10 cycles to finish five instructions, which gives me a CPI of two. So on average, every instruction takes about two cycles to finish. So if I have a billion instructions to finish, I should take about 2 billion cycles. Okay, so that's the next factor in this equation. So I have a billion instructions. On average, each, each instruction takes about 2 cycles to finish. And then I have to also multiply it by the clock cycle time. So I have 2 billion cycles to finish. Each cycle is 1 nanosecond. So when I also factor in my cycle time, the total time it took me to run that program is 2 seconds. Okay, so my CPU time, the total time to finish a program, is a function of the number of instructions. On average, how many cycles does it take me to finish one instruction? And then the length of each cycle. Okay, this also tells me the role of the computer architect or the circuit designer or the compiler writer. Okay, if, if, I'm, if, if I want to improve execution time of a program by improving the clock cycle time, then, you know, that is influenced by... Uh, by, by the quality of my transistors, you know, how fast is each transistor. It is also determined by how I design my pipeline, you know, how well has the architect designed the pipeline. That is, how much work am I trying to get done in every single uh, clock cycle. And then the CPI is the next big factor. It's again influenced by the architect. You know, how efficient am I at processing an instruction? Can I make sure that an instruction can be completed in as little time as possible? And it's also a function of the instruction set design, you know, exactly how much work am I trying to do in every single uh, in instruction. And then the instruction count is also determined by the instruction set and the compiler, right? So how efficient am I in converting my high-level C program into the final instruction count, okay? I should also note that CPI and its inverse IPC are also, uh, uh, they are both very frequently used. Okay, so now having gone through all this background, let me give an alternative perspective uh, and, you know, instead of using the sum of weighted execution times, let me now talk about the sum of IPCs, okay, and I'll do that in the very next video.